We must speak the truth about terror. Let us never tolerate outrageous conspiracy theories, malicious lies that attempt to shift the blame away from the terrorists themselves. Take your own advice. What happens? I tell you what happens. Blam! I have a window that looks directly at the World Trade Center, and I saw... No delusion! Shit's get way too complicated for me. Yeah. Welcome to The Antidote. This is Greg McCarran. This is Jeremy roth Show. All right. It is Saturday, July 15th, 2023, and uh, we're going to dig back into American Compromise by Craig Unger. Yes, we are. And um, I just want to uh, say that I've just since we recorded yesterday, I heard part of an interview that uh, Nick Bryant, who is sort of seen as in some circles as a renowned uh, alternative journalist who covered the uh, Franklin quote unquote scandal. I think his book was the Franklin cover up. Roger Stone goes on to say that he's a crucial, he's the, maybe the crucial journalist who helped rebreak the Epstein story and the way that they dance around Epstein and Trump and, and just sort of keep it totally under wraps, never even deal with the allegations points out to me that this is not just questions of like hardcore neo-MAGA or MAGA uh, that need to understand the level of the cover-up of Trump-Epstein relationship and the the nature of the crimes that Trump has been credibly accused of, but actually really alternative media more generally. Uh, and I know that there are Epstein-Maxwell uh, researchers who have already had a a dubious eye toward Nick Bryant. Um, but I think people need to understand the way that this is uh, covered up in a, in a, uh, in a larger scope. And so we'll, we'll include the link to that interview uh, in, in the show notes uh, as we continue forward with some of the actual historical facts uh, that, that deal with Epstein and then into Trump. Sounds good. And as I was telling you before we started recording, like, Roger Stone is like a great example of, yeah, you got to give the devil his due. He's very, very good at what he does. He is a highly trained long-term operative. And remember, he had some, a little bit of time in the government, right, under under, under Nixon. But uh, he, he claims that he just didn't, he was not uh, cut out for government work. It's sort of similar to the way the move that he made during the Trump campaign, where he basically, oh, I'm not cut out for this campaign. I'm going mm -hmm. dark. And then going dark is apparently totally sort of creating a, a, a wingman seat for him at InfoWars. Yes. It's like he identified Alex Jones as the primary media source that needed to be infiltrated, like and brought into the Trump camp. And if that was the case, like he strategically uh, was very uh, – Good. But it makes sense that um, it's almost par for the course that Roger Stone uh, cut his teeth, so to speak, in an organization called Creep. I mean, that kind of committee to reelect the president, Creep, that, uh, that seems apropos. Definitely. Definitely. All right. Let's get back to this uh, chapter in American Compromat uh, by Craig Unger. We are in the middle of this chapter about who's got the Compromat, uh, page 214. Quote, Epstein wasn't the only one who was obsessed with artificial intelligence. Vladimir Putin was, too. Quote, artificial intelligence is the future, not only for Russia, but for all humankind, unquote, he said in a speech that was broadcast on RT, the propagandistic Russian TV network in 2017. Quote, it comes with colossal opportunities, but also threats that are difficult to predict. Whoever becomes the leader in this sphere will become the ruler of the world, unquote. Uh, full unquote, uh, just a, a qu quick aside here. This is maybe another um, YouTube video that we might link to is uh, the sort of Joe Rogan sphere adjacent uh, podcaster Lex Friedman was the newest uh, quote unquote journalist or podcaster to get a sit uh, an interview with uh, the crime minister himself, Netanyahu. And you can see the level of uh, sort of very deceptive, just straight to, to Lex's face, deception by, by Netanyahu in even just really basically lying about his domestic uh, operations in terms of quote unquote judicial reform in Israel. But the payload again becomes 
the question of AI, Israel, AI dominance, uh, these kinds of uh, things, and so th- I think this is a crucial time. Obviously, with the the ri- the public uh, face rise of the question of AI, and uh, and by the way, on the background of Lex Friedman and the dubious uh, uh, potential background there, um, uh, Charles Johnson at his Substack has written a very interesting uh, write up of Lex Friedman. I think early this year, 2023, that we could also link to for people who want to read in depth on that. And why this sort this sit down interview with the crime minister Netanyahu himself with Lex Friedman is uh, a substantial evidence toward a, an analysis of Friedman not just being some kind of, uh, you know, good faith uh, immigrant in the United States who gets, a, you know, gets a, uh, who becomes an uh, an AI uh, expert and helps uh, Elon Musk with quote unquote self driving cars and is set up at MIT and all of that, but more as we've seen these kinds of long time actor types, you know, uh, in terms of many different spellings of names, uh, questions about the actual nature of his uh, doctoral thesis, uh, his dad's background, his connections and all of that. So, so I just wanted to point that out that this, this uh, question of Epstein and artificial intelligence and all these scientists and the Harvard and MIT connection, and then on into Vladimir Putin's expressed interest in all of this is uh, very uh, timely. All right. Uh, Towards the bottom of page 214 of American Compromise by uh, Craig Unger. Quote, to that end, according to Intelligence Online in October 2019, Putin signed Russia's new national strategy for the development of artificial intelligence by 2030, calling for the, quote, establishment of a security system during the design, development, the installation and use of artificial intelligence, unquote. Sounds like Russia's uh, 2030 plan that like the Saudis have. Is this Russia's version of it? Yes, and on the AI cyber front. And it should be pointed out that that the key figure in the United States around a quote-unquote national security big strategic vision for artificial intelligence is Eric Schmidt, formerly of Google and now Alphabet, and who who wrote his book about AI, the policy questions of AI with uh, Henry Kissinger. And (laughs) and I believe another, there was another co-author on that. So Kissinger's uh, involvement with, uh, with Schmidt and then their involvement at the highest levels of, of big uh, strategy in terms of the United States security state around uh, artificial intelligence should also be deeply noted. Artificial intelligence will bring us our new world order. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, and by, by the way, you keep pointing out to me, Greg, about how someone like former Kissinger Associates, David Rothkopf, uh, took, took uh, Kissinger's 100th birthday to basically call him out and ba- wash his hands of him, basically. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. Yes, the guy who Alex Jones always uh, would name drop is who tried to recruit him into the uh, New World Order, David Rothkopf. Yes, about his book Superclass <laughs> when uh, Rothkopf yeah. was going to maybe discuss it or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And not to say, as our friend John Brisson is fond of saying, you know, not to say David Rothkopf is our guy or anything like that, but there's been some very interesting stuff coming out from Rothkopf over the last few years. Um, he's been calling for almost demanding that uh aid that um if netanyahu doesn't straighten up uh that you know that that aid to israel shouldn't be guaranteed going forward so i mean like it's uh there's so there are some interesting things happening with some of these people that are seen as these uh national security establishment types or i mean i guess he would be more of like a more foreign policy in general than like national security these foreign policy think tank establishment types there's some interesting things going on with some of these people yeah, if if um, Aaron David Miller is the long term sort of American diplomatic core, liberal Zionist, uh, you know, exposer of someone like uh, Washington Institute for Near East Policy and parts of Project for New American Century, Dennis Ross, 
then yeah. David Rothkopf is sort of that uh, in terms of a Kissinger, basically a, a, a close past working relationship uh, who have seen uh, and wanted the public to know some aspects of their discomfort uh, and their criticism of this person that they used to work with, I'd say. Right. And Aaron David Miller was quoted early in the Biden presidency of saying that uh, you're not in Kansas anymore. That's in relation to Netanyahu and uh, the idea that, you know, Netanyahu is not always going to come first anymore. You're not in Kansas anymore. And it's interesting that while there is going to be an Israeli state congressional joint speech being made, it's not being made by Netanyahu. It's being made by the president, Isaac Herzog. Very interesting. Very interesting. So, well, some of, well, some of us remain uh, in the radical middle of America. We remain in Kansas with our eyes, uh, you know, uh, focused on the uh, reality as it evolves and devolves in all these many ways. Okay. All right. Page 214 of American Compromat by Craig Unger. The chapter is Who's Got the Compromat? Okay. Quote, Already, Russia has implemented enormously disruptive campaigns against the United States using unconventional weapons, including disinformation attacks and cyber warfare, campaigns that were vital to installing Donald Trump as president in 2016. But a report from the Brookings Institute concluded that in the future, Russia's use of AI as a weapon can make that look like small potatoes. Quote, AI has the potential to hyperpower Russia's use of disinformation, the intentional spread of false and misleading information for the purposes of influencing politics and societies, unquote, the report says. Quote, and unlike in the conventional military space, the United States and Europe are ill-equipped to respond to AI-driven asymmetric warfare, ADAW, in the information space, unquote. Unquote. I just an aside. I just want to say that that one of the things that needs to be analyzed a little bit more is to to go to a meta information level. So it's not just necessarily about uh, you know information wars warfare or disinformation or misinformation, but actually narrative uh, warfare. And that's when you really get into long term counterintelligence uh, planning and where people where it really becomes like narratives that people are living out. And repeating memes, uh, and sure, the memes themselves maybe could be deconstructed informationally, but there's something beyond that, which includes sort of taking up a whole uh, political culture, and then uh, and then uh, be, being used ultimately as a useful asset for some kind of narrative warfare that you have even no clue that you've been uh, that you've been uh, you know brought into. All right, top of page 215 of American Kompromat by Craig Unger. Quote, in fact, according to Yuri Schwetz, you can't fully understand the scope of Russian intelligence until you understand that Putin sees artificial intelligence, supercomputers, and control of advanced computer technology as Russia's most vital national security issue. Quote, this is for Putin as essential to the survival of his regime as it was for Stalin to get the A-bomb, unquote, Schwetz told me. And quickly, we might make an aside that relate that then to Israel and Ben-Gurion and the bomb. Uh, and then, of course, then the question of the uh, cyber is a great domain of power in terms of the current crime minister and then the current crime minister in Israel's deep, deep geopolitical relationship with Putin uh, that still hasn't really been fully unpacked about the counterintelligence nature of it and the origins of it, I think. I think that might be wise to do. And I, don't, I haven't seen it done well yet. Yeah, I don't know if Trump, I don't know if the Trump operation is, is, is successful without both Putin and Netanyahu being in their respective positions. And I also wanted to mention that uh, what you pointed out, what was pointed out there about uh, Stalin and the necessity of like a nuclear program. It's interesting because then that gets used by you know, people who you could effectively say are pretty Russian-friendly uh, PR agents, such as Oliver Stone, um, that, oh, it was necessary that this would be a necessity because the Americans used the A-bomb to send a message to the Soviets and they could have been next. So, Yes, that's a good point. And then also that then leads me to, to um, remind ourselves of the 
although on the surface of the Soviet-sponsored uh, long-term sort of anti-Zionism used in a similar way as sort of anti-imperialism in terms of di lots of uh, dissident uh, groups around the world and maybe targeted in the West. Uh, and then also, as opposed to the, on the surface, uh, apparently anti-Israel Soviet policy uh, post the founding of Israel, just a reminder that it was it was uh, you know the Soviet Union and Stalin who were the the first to de facto meaning like actually just you know on the phone or something like that or in a communique a diplomatic communique uh, unofficially maybe not publicly to recognize the Israeli state. Now Truman was the first uh, you know on behalf of the United States to recognize it in terms of de jure in terms of international law we might say but i think that 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 crucial de facto recognition by so by the soviets of israel needs to be held in mind when you then read the question of all of their sort of uh, anti-zionist uh, um you know information warfare over many years and then even the up on the surface apparent sort of anti-israel policy or at least sort of working with uh, Israel's quote-unquote enemies uh, during during many decades. And we've brought this up before a few times, and I feel like it's worth mentioning again. We'll probably mention it more in the future that there's the question of what is in the KGB archives regarding the Soviet, you know, Stalin uh, relationship with the Zionist uh, gangs, the, uh, the gangs that were in Palestine that credibly, you know, committed acts of terrorism against the uh, the British forces in in Palestine, among other things, um, that suppose, I guess, are apparently have uh, still kept under wraps by Putin. And I think that's something like people should want to uh, know more details about if they do exist in these KGB archives that are being suppressed and held onto. Definitely. And then when you read it like that, you can then understand a much longer term strategy in terms of what we even then see in the clean break doctrine, where if you see why would the Soviets be backing these as sort of anti-British uh, Zionist terrorist groups early on, you can imagine, of course, they want to begin to uh, create a space uh, that can be broken from, from uh, British and more widely Western geopolitical influence, right? And then what you then read carefully in terms of the clean break paper in 1996 is not only the on the surface geopolitical strategies that people still to this day, including, as I pointed out, Nick Fuentes in his silly, silly, silly framed, maybe on purpose debate with the destiny, who's basically fair, a self-admitted know nothing on uh, the geopolitics of Israel and Palestine and the U.S.-Israel special relationship. But then Fuentes references the clean break paper in a ignorant way again, while accusing Destiny of not even knowing what's in it or reading it. And, uh, and so on the surface, in the, in the clean break paper is a very different policy uh, strategy laid out for Iraq versus Syria, but connecting them on the surface and saying that overthrowing Saddam Hussein, regime change war TM, Tulsi Gabbard in Iraq, is actually part of what they then call for a peace through power relationship with the Syrian government and that they call specifically for uh, containment is the word. Right. A rolling and the, and then if they can get to a rolling back focused on the weapons of mass destruction, this is exactly what we saw happen in Syria. And Russia played the perfect its own perfect good cop role, as we pointed out, where they actually facilitated the clean break uh, paper desires to roll back Syria's WMD uh, program. So and uh, and so that's. And, the, and, you know, it, while, also not facilitate, while also not facilitating what the Clean Break program doesn't call for, which is regime change in yes. Syria. It's not there. That was key to, um, that was key to almost like a insurance, ensuring that there would not be a actual U.S. Uh, military intervention into Syria, which, of course, was the big talk at the time. And that was, there was a pretty significant push for that in this effectively neutralized that, that instead we'll just uh, we'll just 
strike an agreement that Assad, if he destroys his weapons program, then we won't basically we won't go in uh, with the actual serious military intervention. So, uh, yeah, it was pretty, pretty key in this time period when that was a made that was what people thought was going to happen after the um, the uh, Ghouta uh, attacks. Yeah, and then and then the other point that I wanted to make about the clean break paper that's not usually talked about and we don't focus on it maybe enough is that it fits in with this much longer term uh, potential strategic reason for why the or, originally the Soviets had supported this sort of Zionist terrorist in the first place that it actually makes a a, a policy proposal to try that it's important for Isra- Israel's security to wean itself off of. Uh, U.S. military aid. And so for all the talk of like Obama increasing the U.S. military aid to, you know, to $3.8 billion a year over a course of 10 years and all the ways that that whole, uh, I would say, call it a bit of a canard. Sure, it's substantial. It's real. But the main thing in terms of, quote unquote, military support for Israel is the is 9-11 and the war on terror and the war on Iraq, which, by the way, the Frank Luntz uh, talking points, communications PR memo for Leslie Wexner, right, key, key uh, patron uh, and potentially boyfriend of Epstein uh, right after the Iraq war was launched. Uh, it called for um, uh, ex- exactly that kind of thing. And so th- the we begin to really see that like there is this very uh, long-term strategy that's even accentuated by the clean breakers in terms of trying to break uh, break uh, Israel off from this American military aid, which comes along, as we've now seen in the recent years, with the potential threat to the quote-unquote independence of the Israeli quote-unquote security state of of that military aid being disciplined towards policy reform, in, especially in relationship to the Palestinians, where you even have like a liberal Zionist senator like Bernie Sanders beginning to call for disciplining Israeli policy via the nature of that uh, direct U.S. military aid. Aid and so all of this is then, uh, you know, formed in in relationship to things that, uh, for example, in the clean break, they talk about appealing to Newt Gingrich uh, in the in the House at the time in terms of these talking points. But in the background, you see things like Ron Ron Paul and eventually Rand Paul type talking points in terms of foreign aid and breaking yes. uh, off that uh, that foreign aid. Yes, and we're going to dig into this topic uh, here very soon. Um, once again, just like a reassessment of the Israel-U.S. quote-unquote special relationship. I think um, this is a key time to get back into that. And we're going to do that here very soon, maybe even as soon as we finish this um, uh, series. It's going to go a few parts here on this uh, American compromise, Trump, Epstein, um, John Mark Dugan angle. Yes. And one one point that I, I I forgot to mention that I really wanted to say about the the Luntz uh, the Wexner sponsored Luntz framing of the war on Iraq was to not talk about a war on Iraq uh, and basically just uh, connect it as part of the war on terror and always say 9-11. Always, they, say, they specifically say that. Always say 9-11. Remember September. Everything changed with September 11th, 2001. There is no war in Iraq. There's just the war on terror going right. on here. What uh, Ehud Barak said on the morning of September 11th on the BBC, this is a war against terrorism. A war on terrorism. Okay. (laughs) All right, here we go. All right. And even Russia was seen as a crucial ally, according to Barack, um, in what he said that morning. Right. So then you can actually begin to see, like, you know, Putin's role in this much larger narrative warfare in terms of the of him promoting the war on terror even before nine eleven. Yep. All right. Page 215, uh, back to, of uh, American Compromat, chapter Who's Got the Compromat by Craig Unger, back to this quote by Yuri Schwetz. And the quote starts, This is for Putin as essential to the survival of his regime as it was for Stalin to get the A-bomb, unquote, Schwetz told me. Quote, there are 17,000 Russian IT guys working in the United States, and a great number of them are connected with Russian intelligence. 
bright people who've been working inside Apple, Microsoft, and other companies for years. Quote, for Russian intelligence, it would have been like a Klondike to penetrate Epstein's network of tech people who work on artificial intelligence and, and supercomputers. It would have been the equivalent of penetrating the Manhattan Project in World War II, unquote. And then just an, uh, an aside, of course, this be, this then suggests the, the, the areas of weakness or frailty of Unger's uh, investigation here, because the whole point of the, uh, you know, the Israel cyber domination thing, and then the deep connections of Russia and Israel helps show that there's this much even more direct and long term Russian intelligence penetration of the U.S., uh, you know, AI, supercomputer, Silicon Valley, via uh, a state that's seen as the most special ally of the United States, rather than someone who's a, you know, an enemy during the Cold War to a sort of uncomfortable nemesis and maybe potential uh, new ally during the uh, post-9-11 era in Russia. And so that that then, you know, needs to be uh, incorporated into this analysis is the the Israel tech backdoor uh, to Russia and Soviet Union over a long period of time. All right. Middle of page 215 of American Kompromat by Unger. Quote, enter into Jeffrey Epstein's world, Svetlana Posi, uh, Posidaeva, better known as Lana, a striking young Russian multi-hyphenate scholar, model, women's empowerment activist and tech entrepreneur who had ties to both Epstein and procurer Jean-Luc Brunel and has her own suitably curious background in Moscow. Raised in a Moscow apartment complex built for staffers of the NKVD, the Stalinist precursor of the KGB, Posadaeva was educated at the Moscow State Institute of International Relations, MGIMO the prestigious academy run by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that is a training ground for Russian diplomats and intelligence officials. Reputed to be the most elite university in the country, MGIMO has been dubbed the, quote, Harvard of Russia, unquote, by Henry Kissinger, because it has trained so many figures in Russia's political, intellectual, and financial elite. According to the Italian edition of Maxim, Lana gave up a promising tennis career at the age of 16 to become the youngest freshman at MGIMO, where she graduated with the equivalent of summa cum laude, having mastered along the way French, English, Italian, and Spanish, as if she were on course to join the, for the foreign ministry. Her stellar academic credentials notwithstanding, Posedaeva somehow ended up in the orbit of alleged Epstein pimp Brunel by being represented by his modeling agency, MC2. As a model, she was featured prominently in Maxim Italia and Ukraine Vogue, moved to the United States and began her association with Jeffrey Epstein. Unlike the very young local Florida girls, Gilen and her team had recruited from broken homes and trailer parks, Lana, or Lana, was older, at this writing 35, and very well-educated, self-possessed, and refined enough to play hostess to distinguished academics and Silicon Valley titans. Once Posedaeva got to New York, she became president of a New York-based charity called Education Advance, which received most of its $56,000 in funding from Epstein in 2017, to support education, science, and technology. Posedaeva later told the Daily Beast that Epstein's donations, quote, helped develop an impactful program at MIT, unquote. With Epstein's help, Posedaeva also founded a New York-based monthly event series for female entrepreneurs and professionals called WE Talks. W.E. stands for Women's Empowerment, Encouragement, and Entrepreneurship. She took on a partner in Moscow named Victoria Drakova, who had also been educated at MGIMO, and whose CV raised exactly the same questions Lana's did. But Drakova had another feature in her biography that Posedaeva did not. 
Her sister, Masha Drakova, was a celebrated pro-Putin activist in Russia. Best known as, quote, the girl who kissed Putin, unquote, Masha, whose story is related in the 2012 documentary Putin's Kiss, had been an activist in Moscow and a leader of the NASHI, N-A-S-H-I, the pro-Putin youth movement that critics have compared to Hitler youth and have dubbed, quote, Putin Jugend, Putin Jugend, unquote. She became famous when she spontaneously planted a kiss on Putin's cheek during a Nashi rally after joining the group in 2005. As a teen, she had her own online pro-Putin TV show in which she asserted that serving Ru- Russian intelligence is an honorable pursuit. Quote, I really liked Putin, especially after I learned he liked me, unquote, she later told Mashable. Quote, when you're a teenager and the president of the country pays you attention and remembers you, it proves to you that you're important, unquote. She has said that her personal mentors have included Putin himself and v- Vladislav Surkov, the brilliant puppet master, a pu- puppet master who merged the- theatrical techniques with PR to alter the way reality is perceived in Putin's Russia. And uh, quick, unquote, a quick aside, right? Just remember um, the film Hypernormalization, right? And, uh, and, uh, and then remember also that Surkov was called uh, Putin's great cardinal and that one of the main strategies was uh, pushing people to not know politically what was real and what was not. Almost a, that's why hypernormalization to sort of transcend the sense of normal reality. Uh, and then that part of that was do running sort of theater, political theater warfare by uh, basically introducing a lot of different groups, some of them seemingly against Putin or against each other or, you know, across the entire politically perceived spectrum uh, to create a situation where not only that it seemed that there was opposition that was, you know, uh, in reality controlled, but to actually create a, you know, to flood the zone with uh with shit in many ways right which becomes overwhelming then to clarification right clarity clarification or even coherence uh of uh of analysis and then i also have pointed out recently that one of the benefits to political poison merchants such as roger stone or steve bannon or putin and surkov types of, of, of flooding the zone with shit that if you look at it in an agricultural way that 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 zone uh, flooded with shit becomes actually, uh, you know, compost and uh, and basically becomes food to grow a whole bunch of new uh, political narrative based uh, groupings. All right, back to the text, page two seventeen of American Compromat by Craig Unger. The chapter Who's Got the Compromat. Quote, but she says, this is Drakova, Masha Drakova, but she says that she later fell out of love with Putin and took a more critical view of rising Russian nationalism. Whether that quote-unquote delusionment was real is open to question, however. By 2015, she had moved to New York and gone into public relations, serving various tech firms and clients, doing well enough to set up shop in 2017 as Day One Ventures, a venture capital and public relations firm where she was an angel investor in early stage tech startups in Silicon Valley. Day One Ventures has invested more than $30 million in tech startups since 2016. In addition, she served as vice president of communications for Acronis, A-C-R-O-N-I-S, a data protection firm founded by Russian venture capitalist Sergei uh, Belosov, B-E-L-O-U-S-S-O-V, that claims to protect the data of more than 5 million consumers and half a million businesses. Masha, Masha also did public relations for a number of clients, including Jeffrey Epstein. Unquote, uh, end of uh, section. And I'll just, I'll just re-include the, uh, the link to uh, Carrie Kukrell's uh, Twitter account, who is a, a whistleblower, I would say, uh, who who saw a lot of the Silicon Valley stuff from the inside, and they uh, you know tried to um, recruit her and bring her into the fold. 
uh, as a, a talented, uh, you know, both, I think she was both a ballet, but also a very talented uh, a student of science. So I'll include that again in the show notes. All right. Next section here. I believe this is the last section before the end of this chapter. And there's a long um, pi uh, picture section in here that we could go over after we finish this if we have time. All right. Page 217 of American Compromise by Craig Unger. Quote, Drakova's ties to Epstein are of special interest because Vladimir Putin was obsessed with artificial intelligence, supercomputers, and other forms of cutting-edge technology. And Jeffrey Epstein's operation just happened to provide a perfect entry point. After all, technology was high on Epstein's agenda, and his salon of Nobel laureates, Silicon Valley heavyweights, and celebrated academics constituted a, fab a fabulous assemblage of great minds, especially for a college dropout who had studied for two years at Cooper Union. One of Posadayeva's first W.E. Talk salons in May 2018 featured Masha Drakova as a panelist addressing the challenge that only 2% of the venture capital raised goes to female founders. As an intelligence officer, Schwetz had to constantly analyze case files as part of his job. And according to him, Posadayeva's story, much like not Natalia Dubinina, Dubinina's does not quite compute. Quote, she was in one of the best, most prestigious academic institutions in Russia, unquote, said Schwetz. Quote, she could make a breathtaking career in the foreign office or in any foreign company working in the Moscow office. She would make a great career. But instead, she goes into the so-called modeling business? Question mark, unquote. Quote, each intelligence officer operates under a so-called legend or a cover story, he said. This is like their official work history, which they show to the world. The purpose of this legend is to cover up years you spent training at the KGB or FSB, unquote. What was most striking about Posidaeva was that she had a terrific academic career in Russia and then threw it away on something completely unrelated. She attended, as she says, a top college in Russia, like Stanford in the United States, said Schwetz, quote, and she was a straight-A student. This is important to understand. She sacrificed four years and then two more years for a master's degree. It's an achievement, unquote. But suddenly after this, Schwetz noted, quote, she says, fuck it all. Fuck my previous six years. Fuck everything I was doing. I mean, it's amazing. It just does not happen in real life, unquote. According to Schwetz, it all started with Peter Listerman. Quote, it was Listerman who introduced her to Brunel, and Brunel introduced her to Epstein, unquote, Schwetz told me. Quote, of course, we know what Epstein was doing with the ladies, but in this particular case, Epstein takes her and introduces her to renowned American and international scientists, unquote. How could someone as intelligent and well-educated as Posadayeva become an activist for women while possibly seeking patronage from Jean-Luc Brunel and Jeffrey Epstein, who directed and participated in human trafficking and the rape of underage girls for more than two decades? According to Schwetz, the only answer is that it all must have been part of a deliberate effort to introduce Lana to a network of scientists and to help her set up a charity that made lots of donations to companies associated with artificial intelligence. And that leads Schwetz to believe that she was working as a penetration agent with the assistance of Jeffrey Epstein. Quote, she penetrated the network in the United States related to supercomputer and artificial intelligence, unquote, he told me. Posadayeva did not return phone calls or emails from me. Full, unquote, uh, end of chapter. And then there's a bunch of uh, photos that, may, that might be good to sort of just go over these and get a reminder of these instances. Yeah, it sounds good. There's some very interesting photos in this um in this uh, in between chapters here, the photo section of the book, I guess it would be. And I would just say that that um, 
that what you were describing there with this uh, this education project to empower and uplift and all that just sounds like a classic front for other things going on, to say the least. Like you hear in so many cases of like something and some type of cause being used as a front for another uh, type of um, another operation in mind. It's what it sounds like to me. Yes. And we haven't heard a lot about, uh, I mean, I, I know I haven't really become fully acquainted with this Peter Listerman character who's said to be at the epicenter of all of this. And he, he appears to be uh, Ukrainian and with deep connections in both Russia and Ukraine and basically looks like he is a procurer uh, f that includes four aspects of the uh, Epstein uh, network. And and by the way, remember he calls himself a uh, a uh, a matchmaker, not a pimp. <laughs> yeah, it's convenient. Yeah, I mean, his COVID. I guess his COVID. Um, not to say whether you know, maybe um, not to speculate on the you know seriousness of it or anything. But um, that diagnosis was rather. I guess it came up as rather as a good reason to not give any um, any details about anything to Craig Unker when he was researching for the book. So. Yes, and it's interesting. I'll include an article that uh, talks a little bit about him. I think it's titled "Meet Jeffrey Epstein's Russian Pimp Peter Listerman" uh, under uh, CitizenTruth.org, and it, it points out that he uh, that Listerman actually works as a quote unquote matchmaker for uh, mm -hmm. Hollywood types. Actually, it shows a picture of of Listerman smoking a cigar, talking to Hollywood actor Paul uh, Sorvino. Uh, so mm -hmm. this is that he's, you know, he's in the, he's, yeah. the, he's in the, uh, the network, basically the U S network. And this shows that, um, there are Russian elements to Epstein. You know, we hear all the time, of course, about Israel and, uh, or even, uh, stuff related internationally to, you know, say figures such as Prince Andrew, but there is a Russian hand that does seem to be, I mean, to, Certainly, compared to the Israeli hand, uh, hidden, especially within the um, you know, alternative research community, or not emphasized at least. And then I would remind people of uh, of uh, Noel Kassler, who uh, worked with and has a lot of observations from his time uh, being involved with The Apprentice, the reality, the Trump reality show, of uh, what he says about RT having. Um, Having, being stationed basically outside of Epstein's uh, New York property in the uh, final months of his life. So there's uh, definitely, there's some Russian things that go beyond just like Israel or, you know, Russian Zionists or the way it's usually talked about, like in this context of, well, are they really Russians or is it really something else? It, it, there need, there's some things here with Epstein that need to be dealt with and covered more that go beyond just the way people would like to portray anything that's seen as being uh, Russian. There's some things here that need to be uncovered and dug into more. Definitely. And uh, I just want to finish up this uh, section about uh, Listerman by uh, just reading a brief excerpt from this uh, article, Meet Jeffrey Epstein's Russian Pimp Peter Listerman, to point out also the way that you could see this begin to work into elements of like the the culture war and the, where the culture war is uh, fecund grounds for these kinds of very likely intelligence operations. All right, this is uh, the section is titled Listerman, the proud uh, single quote matchmaker. Quote, Listerman reveled in his role as a predatory quote matchmaker, unquote. And if being a jet set pimp for the rich and powerful doesn't demonstrate obscene sex sexism in and of itself, his comments about the women he trafficked and sold do Listerman frequently referred to these women and girls as, quote, unquote, chickens or, quote, tiolki, unquote, the Russian word for virgin cattle, and was supposedly very proud of his ability to procure the youngest and easiest to manipulate females for his clients. Pictures on Russian social media websites and news outlets show photos of an overweight Listerman wearing glasses and smoking huge cigars while surrounded by beautiful women less than half his age. Listerman even gloated to Russian tabloid and former Soviet media mouthpiece Komsomolskaya Pravda about his ability to secure docile and compliant women for his clients. Quote, my Hollywood clients and oligarchs are sick of emancipated Muscovites, European and American women who resemble robots, 
Everybody is sick of these evil women. They want gentle and romantic, unquote. Listerman has been very open. And by the way, un unquote, you know, go look. There's a lot of people who have these Russian wives uh, oh, in yeah. the media business. Who, who was the guy I was just talking about for the Fox News, sort of the funny guy from Fox? Uh, Greg, Greg Gutfeld, who in the wake of Tucker's ab um, exit from Fox is now officially part of their primetime roster now. Uh, not just doing the late night Colbert time slot, but he's actually part of their primetime roster. Greg Gutfeld, yes. And remember one of the other, this, there's a parallel here with one of the other pieces of tradecraft uh, that's a holdover maybe from the Soviet Union that, uh, that Yuri Shvets via Unger in this American Kompromat book exposes that we've talked about uh, a few times before, but that at the one of the benefits to Soviet intelligence at the time of the uh, move to uh, you know push Jewish uh, emigration from uh, from the Soviet Union both towards Israel and to and to the West was that and Schwetz I believe says that ninety percent of the uh, Soviet Jewish uh, refugees or emigres were then under some type of long term uh, responsibility or debt, uh, some type of intelligence indebtedness to uh, Soviet intelligence, right? So you would, you know, at, at the level of something like these models or these sort of sold wives or something like that via Listerman, you got to know that the percentage is probably even higher uh, than 90% in terms of that this is probably totally some kind of intelligence operation in terms of these sold women or these brokered women, or these "quote unquote" match made women, a matchmaker, match match made in hell kind of women, uh, you know, to these uh, American and Hollywood types, like you know that they they are remain some kind of intelligence asset of some sort, and it's not just that he's making money from this or sort of brokering uh, power or something. I don't think. All right, let me just finish this bit so you get the sense of how this is done. This from the article, Meet Jeffrey Epstein's Russian Pimp, Peter Listerman. Quote, Listerman has been very open about his profession and in interviews he often e appears eager to share the secrets of his sordid, depraved world. When asked how he goes about grooming girls to be the future wives of wealthy oligarchs and other elites, Listerman explained that he tells them, quote, I will send you to Paris. You'll live there. You'll live there. You'll chat a little. We'll get you cleaned up. We'll make you a portfolio. I'll show your pictures to a rich man. And if he likes you, he'll give me the money to introduce you. You're going to play around with him a bit. And importantly, listen to Uncle Peter, Listerman's nickname for himself. You are not to let him have you immediately because if you decide to give it to him, then he has to pay more. And then if he likes you and he decides to keep you with him, he has to pay even more. Moreover, Uncle Peter will teach you how to live, unquote. One picture shows Listerman surrounded by no fewer than 10 topless females, some of whom appear to be younger than 18. Listerman holds up a cardboard placard with the words, quote, usual suspect, unquote, written on it while closing his eyes and smiling in a way that would be chilling were it not for Listerman's hairy, sagging chest and flabby paunch hanging over his boxer shorts. God. And then the final, there's this final two brief sentences here. Is Listerman on his way out? Listerman may be laughing now, but given the way the Epstein case caught the international media's attention and doesn't look to be dying off despite Epstein's suicide, it is very likely that Listerman finds himself the usual suspect in a far more serious sort of lineup, the one that takes place in a police station and is not primarily made up of half-naked females. In fact, the same tabloid that published Listerman's remark about his clients being tired of American women later reported that when sighted outside Moscow's opulent Bor Borvika concert hall, one of the venues of the Miss Russia 2019 contest, quote, the scandalous matchmaker was not allowed even to cross the threshold, unquote. And that's the end of that article. And we'll, we'll include that in the, uh, the links. All right, Greg, should we get back to these uh, a few of these photos before we finish uh, up here within uh, the next 10 minutes? Yeah, let's uh, let's go through a few of these photos. All right. First photo here, which is after the page 218 in American Compromat by Craig Unger, is this infamous photo of the Oval Office. 
and I'll just quote from it. Quote, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov left Donald Trump and Russian ambassador, ambassador to the United States Sergei Kislyak met in the Oval Office at the White House on May 10th, 2017. Trump told the Russians that he had just fired, quote, real nut, real nut job, unquote, FBI Director James Comey, who had begun investigating Russian interference in the 2016 election. No American journalists were allowed to record the meeting. Just one photographer from TASS, T-A-S-S, the Russian news agency that has frequently provided cover for Russian intelligence agents. And then when the reporters were allowed into the room after it was over, who did they find sitting on the sitting on the couch? Henry Kissinger. <laughs> yes, Henry Kissinger. <laughs> to be a to be a fly on the wall. And I could probably understand if that's the case. Like I I'm not surprised that uh that people weren't allowed in because what the hell is actually said when all that was going on? And this was around the time of when Trump was uh was under fire, under criticism for giving um documents from Israel related to ISIS to Russia. So like, this is a very interesting time. This is just before he went to Saudi Arabia and Israel too. And by the way, let's say that Michael Moore's uh, naming of uh, a Fahrenheit 11.9 had sort of, you know, first of all, come out maybe a little earlier and it had caught on earlier. And there actually was a blue ribbon panel rather than uh, sort of a bunch of sort of nebulous FBI, DOJ investigations that then get handed over via Rod Rosenstein to the Mueller investigation. If there were actually an 11-9 commission, don't you bet that they would have tried to make Henry Kissinger the head of that as they tried to make him the head of the 9-11 commission? (laughs) And once again, there would have been probably too much public backlash, but I could see that. Yeah. Um, I could see uh, Nancy Pelosi, I could see like uh, the problematic elements in the, uh, in the, congressional circles and uh, governmental circles wanting to make that happen. Yeah. And it, and it would have been sort of like the Sarah Kenzier types who would have been trying to push to yeah. sort of show the background of Kissinger and yes, Nancy yes. Pelosi would have had her people attack them and cut them off <laughs> right, and all right. that. Yeah. Yeah. And then ultimately you probably would have gotten somebody who could have turned out to still be um, on, on a level of a, a major level of problematic uh, ties as it related to the person who actually did take over, but that would be Philip Zelikow. So it may have ultimately reduced into something like that. But I could see a push for like a Kissinger to head an 11-9 commission, heaven forbid. And by the way, I think I think they, Zelikow was also a part of some kind of uh, panel to investigate uh, COVID, the newest 311 oh, operation, I believe. So yeah, there's that. All right. The bottom of this page in terms of photos is an infamous photo from Helsinki. Uh, President Donald Trump met with Russian President Vladimir Putin in Helsinki on July 16th, 2018, and stunned observers when he sided with Putin over the FBI, which had concluded Russia had attacked America's 2016 elections. And it's them going into the handshake together. This is the Trump-Putin meeting, I believe, according to the Jerusalem Post, the Trump-Putin meeting that made uh, made Netanyahu very happy. Um, <laughs> right, where and where Trump where Trump says he's like Putin's a big fan, he loves BB. What we totally agree on is BB. BB's a great guy. Putin loves BB, loves him some BB. Yeah, I looked at Putin's eyes, and he loves BB. Back in happier times, before Trump uh, got angry at Netanyahu for. Uh, for being, you know, in his words, the first person to congratulate Biden, which wasn't the case, but uh, anyway. Yeah, yeah. It Back in happy it was the fir- It was the first person who was maybe directly involved in helping install him as president, maybe, maybe who uh, recognized Biden. And, you know, it's interesting that um, Trump was seen as a hero in some circles for siding with uh, Putin over American uh you know, intelligence and security agencies. If that had been uh, Netanyahu, then like it would have been Trump siding with like the uh, with his government over the deep state Western media that's always trying to attack Bibi. So. <laughs> and intelligence agencies that are seen as like a thorn in his side, the corruption scandals and all that. So you know, it's uh, you know, you could have replaced Putin with Netanyahu, and you could have had a similar type of uh, dynamic take place. But since it's Putin, you got all these people who think that uh, oh yeah, this is. This Trump's the good guy for a side A with Putin over the over American uh, alphabet agencies. Definitely. All right. Next page of the pictures. There is a much younger Donald Trump shaking hands with the Gipper. 
Quote, Donald Trump's obsession with nuclear arms and his insistence he could negotiate between Ronald Reagan and the Russians provided an <laughs> opening for the KGB to cultivate Trump. That's very interesting because we've been looking back. Uh, we uh, and we'll talk. We'll have to talk more about this. But that's interesting. Trump and the, his, uh, the cultivation. I believe the KGB cultivation, according to Yuri Shiva, started before the 1987. Uh, Meeting that he made, a trip that he made to Moscow, I believe Fourth of July time period, where he came back uh, writing, you know, floating a potential presidential campaign into the media and writing uh, or full page ads about uh, U.S. Uh, security commitments and all of this. And uh, and it's interesting because um, this would have been the time period, though the Reagan administration in '87 was the um, putting in place of this uh, of this uh, arms treaty that the. Um, the hawks, the Pearl Nest, Richard Pearl Nest, uh, neocon hawks at the time, uh, the Frank Gaffney types were seen as being very much against. And um, George Bush's uh, Carlisle group, uh, one of his right hand men, uh, Frank Carlucci, comes in as defense secretary. And Frank Gaffney has his bags packed within four days, according to, um, according, I believe, uh, I believe it was Washington Post, maybe. Um, and then so that's interesting if Trump was seen as like the person between like the K KGB and uh, like he saw himself as like, I can do this. And then there's this big fight that hasn't really been analyzed or dealt with between um, within the Reagan administration and basically the George H.W. Bush gang that would later go on to um, in his presidency would have a hostile relationship with the hardliners in, his, in uh, Israel, among other things. Yeah. The, and the people that the Frank Gaffney types are so close with. And so this is interesting if Trump saw himself as like this intermediary when this goes on. And then fast forward, what, 32, 33 years later, and it's Donald Trump ripping up this arms treaty that these neocon hawks hated. Very interesting. And that what pops in my mind then is this, the, the Richard Pearl, right? And remember that the, the first page of the preface of George Tenet's uh, autobiography, I think called Center of the Storm, uh, Tenet, the, uh, the director of Central Intelligence Agency uh, during end of uh, Clinton years and through 9-11 into the Bush years. And then the self-proclaimed scapegoat of the Iraq war that on the very first page of his uh, autobiography in the preface, it talks about him being startled or maybe even stunned about going into the white house on September 12th, 2001 and, uh, and seeing that Richard Pearl is on his way out. So I almost see like a parallel, like uh, between Henry Kissinger sitting in the White House. Kissinger is not an official position person in the actual White House. Pearl is not really in an official position in terms of the Bush White House after 9-11. Yeah. And Kissinger is sitting there after what you might call the first big move by yeah. the executive branch to, I would, I would say, I would say signal intent to cover up the 11-9 operation, right? Getting rid of the head of the FBI as the head of the FBI had talked about uh, Flynn and Trump had tried to convince mm -hmm. uh, Comey to let uh, Flynn go. And also Flynn had told Trump about the, uh, you know, the dossier and the potential yeah. investigations into Russian uh, in, in uh, you know, uh, interest in, the, in attacking the 2016 election. And then Trump gets rid of him. And then who's sitting uh, as the unofficial official there is Henry Kissinger as Trump uh, yes. bars American journalists and hosts, uh, you know, R Russian officials and journalists. Yes. And then you have um, the... Um, and then ultimately what happens is um, not so much uh, Richard Pearl himself directly, but all these people close to Richard Pearl, like Fife and David Wormser and Michael Maloof, then just go and set up their own operations uh, to to uh, move and to set up a push, uh, push narratives that are outside or free from the the limits of the CIA and of the alphabet agencies and the national security establishment. So uh, that happens in the aftermath of this meeting. And it seems like it's much less, um, that's, you know, um, this is probably on par in terms of like symbolic importance as uh, what Wesley Clark had always said he heard in the meetings after September 11th of the, oh, we're going to go into seven countries and all this. But like, you know, this symbolism of Pearl being in there, I think is pretty significant, especially when it's the Richard Pearl nest of uh, close hawkish um, allies of his that were at the center of pushing the um, the 
the intelligence narr- the narratives and the faulty faulty to say the least intel and other uh, narratives that led to um, the justification for going into Iraq. Definitely. All right, let's just run through a few more of these photos, is if that's cool, Greg. Yep. All right, the bottom of the second page of photos on the left is, okay, you'll see, quote, in July 1987, Trump is seen here with first wife Ivana at the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg during his first trip to the Soviet Union, the one that you just previously referenced. According to Yuri Shvets on the right, a former major in the KGB, Trump's trip was initiated and set up by the KGB, which oversaw the entire trip. Yeah, and unfortunately, there are some people who just want to make this out to just be, oh, this is just a kooky conspiracy theory from the from the demented brain of Lyndon LaRouche. And, you know, it just happened to be that EIR, Executive Intelligence Corps, put out the maybe most serious uh, work about this, um, about what was going on this time period. But it was not an invention from the brain of Lyndon LaRouche that can be used to discredit, quote unquote, Russiagate. No, it's very real. No, and there's sources here now that are, you know, this is... This was uh, published, what, post-Trump uh, or in the last year of Trump, I think? Yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, I mean, this is really getting into the depths of the, some of the actual counterintelligence, long-term planning, deep politics behind the 11-9 operation. The uh, part of the 11-9 operation that was always, as we pointed out, being covered up by the limited hangout of, quote-unquote, Russiagate, uh, or even aspects of the sort of the sort of... Uh, surface level reporting on the Steele dossier, which sort of pointed to a five-year period or something like that uh, of cultivation of this plan. And maybe Trump had been cultivated a little bit earlier. Now, this goes directly towards former KGB, uh, you know, sources to point out, no, 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 all the way back, every, every, since Trump has been going, you know, to Russia or in formerly the Soviet Union, this was KGB was involved, which we've pointed out. It's obviously the case of any kind of big guy like that, you know, big American coming to the Soviet Union. You imagine it'd be not above 90 percent that the KGB was involved in some way in, or at least interested in it. So and I'll uh, make one more um, one more reference here is that um, I believe um, a while back I'd heard uh, Rudy Giuliani uh, talking about going to a New York Yankees game in this time period, summer of 87 with Trump. And I believe uh, Richard Nixon was there. And Nixon is, uh, according to Giuliani, Nixon was trying to um, sell Trump on running for president. And this is all while Giuliani is um, in place in uh, New York to basically oversee the replacement of the Italian mafia with the uh, Russian immigrant mafia. Yeah. And then we'll we'll get, we're getting to that on the next page here, the, the background of that too. Yeah. Definitely. So on the next page here of the pictures, uh, third page uh, in American Compromat, you have uh, a picture of Semyon, quote, Semyon Kislin, Semyon Kislin, who is co-owner of Joy Lud Electronics. That's Joy dash L-U-D Electronics, which was allegedly controlled by the KGB and sold hundreds of TVs to Trump more than 40 years ago. According to Yuri Schwetz, Kislin appeared to be a, quote, spotter agent, unquote, who opened the door for the KGB to develop Trump. And th- by the way, this is a scre- from a screenshot of Semyon Kislin's YouTube channel, which is sort of interesting. Huh. And by the way, this was a, 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 a sort of a, a semi-minor detail that was included in Unger's uh, first book on these matters, uh, House of Putin, House of Trump, that talked about this... Um, this actually, actually, I might might have seen it in um, Red Mafia by Robert mm-hmm. Friedman about about Kislin and this electronic store, and I started hypothesizing about that's the perfect kind of place, yeah. not only to sort of like b- do spotter agent work, but also to supply hotels, which are the, obviously yeah. these key places of potential compromise, including with these quote unquote models or call girls or, you know, elite, elite women or something like that in terms of these hotels in the New York uh, uh, area in terms of, you know, installed uh, surveillance technology. Yeah. So in a certain way, you see that Epstein and Trump, very likely, depending on Trump's, you know, nature, the level of his knowledge of all of this, 
that they, at the very least they were operating in the very same kind of, uh, you know, set up to uh, provide compromise or surveillance on on certain targeted people uh, at the same kind of time so that that Trump very likely I'll bet had you know KGB installed uh TVs which were very likely contained the ability to transmit or at least collect audio or visual uh compromat or intelligence on people who were in these hotels before Jeffrey Epstein even was then given the pre-wired Je- uh, Les Wexner the uh, seventy billion dollar brownstone in Manhattan, where which is the site of the very credible allegations of rape by Katie Johnson against both Donald Trump and Epstein. Yes, and uh, and back in the twenty eighteen time period, you were bringing this up on False Flag Weekly News, and Kevin Barrett, your you know host, uh, was it was just going just totally going over his head in one ear and out the other with them. But you were bringing this up, and uh, the significance of it was not, I don't think, even attempted to be grappled with or dealt with. That's true. And then on the bottom of this page, the third page of photos in American Compromise by Craig Unger goes to, you know who, Rudy Giuliani. Quote, in the 1990s, New York Mayor Rudy Giuliani, who later became President Trump's lawyer, marched with the future president on Fifth Avenue in the Steuben Day Parade. Semyon Kislin, who allegedly first identified Trump as a potential target for the KGB, had become a major Giuliani supporter. And it shows uh, Giuliani like in a real weird sort of salute with his face. And then Trump's there sort of act, trying to act cool. And um, But this, of course, is the background of what you were begin talking about, Greg, in terms of Giuliani's actual crucial role in terms of opening up, cleaning the territory of the Italian mob for the Russian mob's major, major uh, moves and takeover and escalation, especially from the late 80s into the 90s and then really strong in the early 2000s, which is then where the uh, heightened cultivation of Trump as an asset via many different modes, including the MICE uh, acronym, counterintelligence, money, not so much ideology, but you could imagine if, you know, the way that the Listerman was uh, painting the ideology uh, of the sort of these, these better, more uh, docile uh, Russian and Ukrainian uh, women to be sold to these uh, powerful oligarchs from Europe and the West, that that might be part of the ideology that, uh, that Trump was uh, yeah. brought into and cultivated. So money, ideology, compromise, and ego, obviously, playing all along the way here with Trump and the KGB. Definitely. And I would I would imagine that the ego could be used to create like this uh, actual belief in like some type of, uh, you know, ego could lead to ideology like, oh, I'm the guy who's put, I am the guy who wants this like, you know, the ego and propping up his ego could lead to um, a, a, like almost like a false sense of belief in like a certain type of ideology that isn't like legitimate, but at the same time is like boosted by like appealing to the ego. I could see that. Definitely. All right, let's just do two more pages here of these photos. And uh, unless they're, eh, we could, I don't know, we'll see. Let's, um, let's move to the next page. I think this is page four of the photos uh, uh, in American Compromise by Craig Unger. Quote, at left, a mugshot of Robert Hansen, the FBI agent and Opus Dei member who had spied for the Russians, and at right, his brother-in-law, Father John Wauk, W-A- A-U-C-K, an Opus Dei priest who also served as a speechwriter for Attorney General William Barr in the administration of George H.W. Bush. And then on the bottom is, quote, William Barr, just after being sworn in as Attorney General in 1991, his religious zealotry merged with his absolutist interpretation of the, quote, unitary executive, unquote, to help forge policies that gave President Trump almost dictatorial powers. Unquote. On the right, oh, go for it, Greg. Oh, I'm just saying that's just a reminder that it remains important not to try to rehabilitate Bill Barr because he didn't go along with uh, stealing the election and trying to overthrow the government. Right. And especially since Barr is the crucial closer, as we called him, if Mueller was, you know, pitched the first seven innings of the quote unquote Russiagate 
uh, investigation. Then Barr comes in to uh, close the game by getting out ahead of the actual report, which shows tons of Russia, Trump, Russia collusion, uh, and, but not, quote unquote, establishing proof of conspiracy in a legal fashion between Trump operatives and Russian, quote unquote, officials. Right. Uh, and then Barr gets ahead of that to with a talking point that to this day is played all around the, quote unquote, alt media all throughout Twitter and spaces and all of that by all these people about and we just had someone trying to say this to us in a Michael Tracy space the other night about how there was no Mueller found no. No evidence of collusion. Not true. Not true. But Barr got ahead of it by basically sort of highlighting certain points and using phrases from the report that could then be the sort of de facto uh, actual fullness of the report, putting aside even the fact that there was all these Senate uh, uh, Select Committee for Intelligence, uh, you know, the volume five report that really went much even deeper beyond the Mueller report in terms mm-hmm. of the 11-9 operation included uh, touch, touch, uh, tie-ins to the Middle East and Israel. And there were, I believe it was the Republican members of the uh, Intelligence Committee, including uh, Marco Rubio particularly, who attempted to like downplay in their official statements what was actually in the report as far as like the um you know the implications of it so there was that attempt going on um and then also i would say that uh <laughs> that bar um i actually forgot my other point there is going to be regarding uh regarding bill Barr, but the there was the attempts to downplay the intelligence uh report and official statements by say rubio and people like him but also then i would say in a sort of false reality that I would say people, some people live in like Bill Barr is seen as like proof that, oh, well, there really was nothing found because he's all part of like the, you know, he's seen as part of like the deep state conspiracy to push like Russia gate to, to hurt, uh, you know, to hurt Trump and escalate tensions with Russia. So, I mean, that's unfortunately something there where like, oh, Barr has to be taken seriously on this because he's part of the, he's part of the group that would want to pin all of this on Trump and on Russia. So anyway, I digress. Definitely. All right. Next page of the photos in American Compromise by Craig Unger is, quote, Opus Dei founder, Saint Jose Maria Escriva, Escriva de Balaguer Center, prays with other Opus Dei officials in June 1974. A small number of officials with ties to Opus Dei played key roles in establishing a new Catholic rite that gave unbridled power to the presidency. Right. And as pe- many people have noted that there is a, you know, the, there is an over, there is obviously a sort of domination of the Supreme Court yeah. by those of uh, maybe you might call religiously Catholic and then Jewish backgrounds, obviously way overrepresented, totally a uh, super majority dominated, basically mm-hmm. almost all of them. Right. So there's this aspect of the question of like these these sort of shadowy Catholic power broker networks, mm-hmm. obviously in this, and even Barr, right. Sort of coming into this sort of Catholic uh, society comes from some Jewish background. So it's like, becomes like a Jewish opus a day or something like that. Similarly to like Steven Mnuchin gets into what was a more uh, waspy kind of secret society, uh, skull and bones as one of the, uh, you know, earlier generations of Jewish uh, skull and bones. That's a good point. And I would also um, I would also imagine that I would suspect that my sense is that someone like Mel Gibson, Passion of the Christ now, um, uh, oh, well, Sound of Freedom um, is uh, somebody who probably his tra- quote unquote traditional Catholicism that he and his father pushed, you know, the anti-globalist Vatican II Catholicism probably has some tie ins to some level or another with this like Opus Dei type of um, contingent. That would be my guess. That that would make sense to me. All right, bottom of this page of photographs in American Compromise by Craig Unger is, quote, Leonard Leo, executive vice president of the Federalist Society, on the steps of the Supreme Court in Washington, D.C., March 2017. Leo and the Federalist Society have overseen the selection of hundreds of conservative judges, including those on the Supreme Court. And then, of course, now you have to then factor in in the recent years, uh, just last year, actually, the uh, from the Times of Israel, quote, secret secretive donor to pro-Israel cause causes gave one point six billion dollars uh, to the Federalist Society. Barry side, mm-hmm. Right. 
to to U.S. conservative uh, uh, nonprofit, right? Yeah. Um, and then, by, by the way, right, Barry Side, uh, he's the owner of Triplight. So this is where, you know, this uh, China-Israel connection comes in because a lot of the background of his business is uh, a, lot of, um, a lot of Chinese money in there. So similarly, you might see behind, uh, you know, the uh, Daily Wire and um, uh, Ben Shapiro, as a very China Israel with this sort of um, American sort of fundamentalist uh, kind of Christian mm -hmm. overlay with uh, fossil fuel interests there. I think you see something similar with Barry side giving $1.6 billion to these, uh, you know, Len Leonard Leo Federalist Society causes a China Israel uh, connection here. And then most recently we had the uh, expose of Leonard Leo and, um, oh, uh, the Supreme court justice, um, Name's escaping me. Um, um, Alito, Sam Alito, and oh no, Sam Alito and uh, Paul Singer, which shows like, and of course, Singer, you know, th there was an attempt to dis to separate any type of vacationing or spending time with Singer from actual Supreme Court decisions. But what it, what I think that shows is that um, while I don't think, and I mentioned this before, I don't think Paul Singer really has much of a dog in the fight of like the culture wars or anything like that. It shows at the very least like these significant figures are that they stand to, or at least they have, a, there's a belief that their interests stand to benefit from this, um, from this judicial, um, from this particular uh judicial leaning in the uh, American justice system that goes, that is, happens to be in line with these uh, cultural shifts and uh, fighting these uh, war, these you know, basically wars for control of society, combination of the culture wars and the destruction of the administrative state, as Steve Bannon says. So at the very least, there's a symmetry of, or a synchronizing of, of, uh, of seen as uh, of it being a beneficial to a person like Paul Singer and his ilk. So. Yeah, some people see like the Federalist Society's work as some kind of like really just all ideological and in service of like the, you know, the sort of religious right uh, interests. And I think that is just the vehicle for what is really the amplification of escalating the culture war uh, in many ways and really uh, pursuing divide and conquer politics at the highest levels of the U.S. judiciary. Uh, that's the, I think that's the way to actually see what the act, what they're actually buying. Sure, they're serving their base on the surface of it so that they can continue to get the continued political and financial support from the American religious right. But underneath it all, I think what's serving these very likely uh, foreign interests that are very obvious between someone like Barry's side and his $1.6 billion donation to this network is actually a pursuit of culture war as some of the best forms of political warfare, divide and conquer, destabilization, uh, and also to make sure that the United States is not actually handling at the highest levels of uh, judicial, uh, you know, uh, judicial oversight, the, the kinds of issues that really need to be uh, looked at in terms of uh, both American ju jurisprudence, but also American political, economic, and, uh, and real social life. All right, Greg, should we just... Uh, just run through these last, uh, a couple last pages here of these photos um, and then uh, call call it a day for now. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm enjoying this. This is, uh, I felt like uh, this is this is good that we're doing this. Um, there's a lot to be said about these photos. Yeah, let's go through a few more. All right, there's some of the, these, there are a few infamous photos here, some of which we've talked about, but one of which we've talked about before. Okay, on the top left, uh, of this uh, next page in the photos of American Compromise by Craig Unger, quote, the so-called bouncing check Robert Maxwell left, shown here with USSR General Secretary Leonid Brezhnev, had access to the corridors of power all over the world and often acted as a friend of the KGB, among other intelligence agencies. Right um, under, oh, go for it, Greg. Oh, I was going to say Maxwell in this regard should probably be looked at in a similar vein as uh, Armand Hammer was viewed as being like this intermediary with all these, uh, you know, the guy who was seen as having access to both Moscow and Washington all the way from, uh, I believe it was said that he had access all the way from like at least the, uh, um, transcending all the way at least from like the Wilson Roosevelt days to the um, 
to the Bush senior days and and on and, and in all in between there. So he could be seen as like a similar to a, maybe an Armand Hammer type of figure in terms of that type of influence in multiple countries and you know supposed hostile uh, governments being welcomed by by uh, ma- by many of these entities. Although I don't know how welcomed Maxwell was in the U.S., but I think there's a case could be made for that on a global scale. There could be it could be looked at in a similar vein in terms of like the amount of influence they wield. Yeah, and I would say that it's sort of arm and hammer from the up uh, with a weight on the other towards the other side of the Atlantic, right? Because obviously Maxwell was a core figure in terms of uh, British politics and media and all of that, but obviously then way really close to the highest levels over long periods of time to uh, the Soviets, and then obviously Israel uh, intensely with Maxwell. Where and then I think it's also the case that that it was only toward the end of his life of Robert Maxwell where he began to really push into the more commanding heights of uh, of the American network, uh, which then includes his uh, you know being connected via Kissinger to this uh, you know renowned Senator John Tower. Uh, which I think then marked the beginning of a major escalation of his uh, American influence uh, operations. Not that he wasn't here before, but that marked a, a, a big change. But it was only a few years later then that he was dead. So, And John Tower and Robert Maxwell ended up dead within, I believe, uh, six months of each other, I want to say roughly six to eight months. Uh, John Tower, plane crash, and then Robert Maxwell drowns on his boat. So, Yeah. All right. The the photo under um, Brezhnev and Maxwell, um, there's another guy here, but he's not uh, identified. The photo underneath that is, quote, Maxwell with daughter Guylaine in 1984, long before she became an alleged sex trafficker and partner of Jeffrey Epstein. Her father often said she was the favorite of his nine children. Now, of course, there's a whole uh, I- investigative controversy about exactly when um, Epstein and Guylaine uh, were, were together, Epstein and Robert Maxwell. And, and I haven't really sort of sussed out the truth of all of that quite yet. All right. On the bottom, quote, British media mogul Robert Maxwell at the House of Parliament, at the Houses of Parliament in London to take up his seat after being elected uh, MP in 1964. Interesting year for him to enter there. Huh? Mm-hmm. Next page of photos in American Compromise by Craig Unger is, quote, Trump at an event with John Tower, former senator from Texas, veteran broadcaster Mike Wallace, second from right, and media baron Robert Maxwell. Tower became a fixer for Maxwell and opened doors for him in America's intelligence apparatus. Yeah, that's right at- Okay. Yeah, that's the photo we've talked about before on numerous occasions. And uh, anyway. Yeah, it's quite a photo. And uh, there's still an unidentified person there to the left. And I'm not sure who that is. Maybe someone's identified him at this point. Seems like he's vaguely familiar, but all right. Then right underneath that is immediate, quote, immediately after Robert Maxwell's death in 1991, his daughter, Ghislaine Maxwell, went to her father's yacht, Lady Ghislaine, and ordered documents to be shredded. And there's a picture of her on the yacht. Uh, mm-hmm. there's, it looks like there's a photographer and then crew people there. Dead men and shredded documents tell no tales, I guess. That's true. And this is this is one of the key pieces that shows that Ghislaine was very likely... In terms of like the core human intelligence, let's say tradecraft of Robert Maxwell, that he she was the next generation, uh, the protege of that part of Robert Maxwell's um, legacy or, you know, espionage legacy. She was always the she was the one who handled this after his death. So he went to go make sure there were certain secrets that were either secured and or shredded. Uh, So. All right, and then finally on the bottom of this uh, page of photos in American Compromise by Craig Unger is, quote, Jean-Luc Brunel, a French model agency boss who allegedly trafficked young girls with Jeffrey Epstein, snuggles up with Guy Lan Maxwell in 1992. <laughs> by the way, has Ryan, has Ryan Dawson ever mentioned 
the connection with Robert Maxwell and the KGB, I would hope that he's at least mentioned it to basically say, well, those were earlier days. That says nothing about now or a Putin Russia or anything like that. <laughs> That's a good question. I wouldn't be surprised if he hasn't, but I don't know. He talks about Jean-Luc Brunel a lot uh, up through his uh, apparent death in prison. All right. Well, the next next uh, time when we reapproach uh, this book, we will then get deeply into the Dugan, the John Mark Dugan stuff. And so there's actually some photos uh, of uh, of Dugan, including with Pavel Borodin, this key uh, manager of you know hundreds of billions of dollars of major assets, real estate assets of the Russian state, and a, a key early. Um, you know, provider of uh, Krisha, of roof, of roof protection and uh, political uh, guidance uh, into key positions of Vladimir Putin, Pavel Borodin, with John Mark Dugan, who is said to have some of this Epstein Maxwell audiovisual compromat, maybe hundreds of videos he says that he, uh, you know, was given and has some access to. So we'll we'll go through that uh, next time, including into the next chapter that describes the background of of John Mark Dugan and uh, Pavel Baro. How John Mark du- Dugan met Pavel Barodin. All right. Well, uh, thank you, Jeremy, and we will dig into part three very soon. All right. Thank you, Greg, and thank you to everybody out there listening to us. Uh, you know, giving us research, uh, keeping us informed. We appreciate you. Until next time, Antidote, we are out.